Future Trends Forum recording that you're about to watch is an unusual one. Uh, our typical forum sessions uh, are entirely online, uh, involving dozens or hundreds of people around the world, all connected by the Shindig live video conferencing technology. But every so often, maybe about once a year, we do a hybrid or blended event where we do the usual online event, but we host it in a physical meeting with dozens or hundreds of people. And it's always an ambitious and tricky thing to do, uh, both in terms of practice to make sure everybody's involved, but also technologically to take care of sound and video. So this past week in Austin, Texas, at the CCAS Dean's Meeting, uh, I managed to combine our usual video session with a live audience of hundreds of academic deans from across the country. Uh, it was a great audience. They had terrific questions. The AV people did heroic work in trying to make sure all the audio worked. Uh, and the virtual audience had great questions as well as is usual. And we had terrific guests, as you'll see. Now, just one word of warning. Uh, the first roughly 28 seconds, we had a problem with echo on my sound. Uh, so you'll hear that. It'll be impossible to miss. But I want to make sure that you just see that introduction because that's where I get to try and bring the face-to-face -face crowd involved. And if it's too hard to hear, just skip the first 28 seconds and then it's on with the show. Um, by the way, this is me just doing an informal form recordings. I usually don't do that. Usually the recordings are just the, the show itself. But if you think this introduction is a good thing, uh, let me know. Happy to do that in the future. On with the show. Um, our, our virtual, virtual audience, audience has, has about 41, 41 people, people, and our, our in-person audience, audience has three nice interlocutors on stage, plus dozens or hundreds, hundreds of people in the audience. Just if everyone wants to say hi, say hello. And everyone online is like, what, what is going, going on? on? Uh, what we have is a uh, major, major topic that we've been talking about for years and years in the forum, and of course, which everybody here at the Dean's Conference has been thinking about forever which is how enrollment is changing in higher education. And we've been covering this since enrollment peaked in 2012. And one of the best sources for enrollment information and just a really good source of people to talk to is the National Student Clearinghouse. Uh, we have their research director, uh, currently vice president for research and executive director, Doug Shapiro. And I'm going to bring him up on stage right now to ask him about his new research. And for those of you who are online, as well as those of you who are looking at the screen, you should see on the bottom left of the screen a little button. Uh, that's a link to uh, Doug's newest research effort right now. Uh, good afternoon, Doug. Can you hear us okay? I can hear you. Can you hear me? With the absolute delight in my heart. Excellent. How are you doing, sir? I'm good, thanks. How are you? Oh, I'm, I'm just fabulous right now. Uh, and where are you today? Are you in New York? I'm in New York. I'm at home in Brooklyn. Ah, very good. Very good. Well, hello, uh, greetings from Austin, Texas. Uh, we'll be at the uh, CCAS event where you have a room full of deans who are now partially figuring out what's going on, um, but they will have questions for you uh, as well as our online audience who will have lots of questions as well. Um, so first thing, uh, Doug, I just wanna ask, this is a question I always ask you when you come on the, on the program, what are you working on for the next year? What are the uh, projects that are top of mind for you? Well, let me start by saying top of mind, we're always the most focused on just getting the important facts out about what's happening in higher ed enrollments and students and institutions um, so that we are informing colleges and universities in particular, but also policymakers and students and, and families and their advisors um, about what's what's really going on out there beyond their campus or beyond their home uh, state or region uh, so that they can make decisions that are that are timely and and um, and positive for educational access and opportunity for all students who need it um, we are uh, this year in particular we're really focused on um, on what's happening with uh, freshmen, particularly 18-year-old freshmen um, or new high school graduates and, and low-income students generally, um, uh, including 
institutions that serve uh, large numbers or high shares of, of uh, financial aid recipients, Pell recipients in particular. This is something that we haven't focused on a lot in the past, um, but I think has really risen to a more urgent area of concern and um, um, yes. salience in this, that particularly this term, because as you all know, a lot of a lot of concerns about the um, the situation with the FAFSA both last year and this coming year. Mm -hmm. um, and also just a lot of new questions about the cost and value of college and concerns about um, um, what's happening in the workforce that are, I think, changing um, students and families thought, thinking about higher education generally. And so this is these kinds of, these kinds of concerns um, not to mention the the whole change in uh, affirmative action from the Supreme Court's decision, just a whole host of headwinds that just seem to be really focused on freshmen this year, and so we're going to keep keep our uh, kind of magnifying glass on that on that subgroup in particular. Um, Thank you. A little, just one more point though, because a little bit longer term, we're also hoping to work um, to to extend uh, our work from a couple of years ago that looked at um, college closures and what kind of impacts uh, that had on students when their when their colleges closed, how many students were able to transfer uh, to another institution and eventually complete a degree. Um, and as you all know, there have been uh, uh, some some levels of acceleration of closures, um, partly due to the pandemic, but other factors as well. Um, and so again, there's more concern about what what's going on with college closures and how that's affecting students. Another thing that we're we're looking to to um, uh, focus on. That'll probably be later this year or even early next year, though. <coughs> Doug, you've just described a research agenda for a small army. <laughs> I, I'm I'm so glad that you're on the case uh, because you I mean you singular but also you plural your whole team you do such great work um, <clears throat> friends I'm going to ask Doug a couple of questions just to start rolling uh, the topic about uh, the latest research into enrollment numbers but then I'm going to turn it over to all of you for your questions so uh, first not right the second but a few minutes um, my wonderful three deans here on the stage uh, may have some questions but also people online. So again, as you're listening to Doug and I uh, talk, especially Doug, think about the questions that you might have. And if you haven't had a chance to see the report, again, look in the bottom left-hand corner of the screen where you can see that little tan-colored lozenge. That'll be a link to it itself. Uh, Doug, one of the things that I find really heartening uh, and impressive about the data that you shared uh, recently is that enrollment in fall uh, this fall semester seems to have really improved across a number of registers. Uh, something like 40 odd states that you had data for uh, across almost uh, all, all sectors, uh, definitely across people of color, both genders rising at the same amount. It seemed like a, I mean, overall, we're talking about a 2.9% increase in the student body. Uh, this just sounds like a, a real relief after years and years of decline. Is, is, is my picture accurate so far? Well, yes and no. I mean, you know, we, 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 um, in many ways, this report was very puzzling, and one of them, one of those ways, is at the at the top level, where we saw, as you just described, a very healthy three percent increase in the total number of students enrolled as uh, in undergraduates as undergraduates. But at the same time, the number of new incoming freshmen, uh, first time students of all ages, has declined by even more so a, a five percent decline in new uh in freshmen um uh, a six and a half percent decline in 18 year old freshmen so new uh, high school graduates essentially and um, um and even steeper declines at uh for freshmen at four-year institutions it's more like eight percent wow um, so 
Yeah, it's very much a good news, bad news. I mean, I think certainly, um, you know, schools are, are whole, for, from the perspective of co the colleges and universities, having more total undergraduates enrolled is a good thing. Um, um, but I think in the longer term, uh, this sharp decline in freshmen this year, that's going to persist as it works. You know that that class works its way through the through the undergraduate pipeline. Um, there will be constrained undergraduate numbers just from this class alone uh, for 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 several to more years to come. Good news and bad news indeed. Um, that's uh, uh, it's really good to see that healthy increase. But that first year student drop. Uh, I know you've been asked this before, but I've, I've got to ask, could you, could you speculate a bit? I, I know your job is to collect the data and to analyze it very closely, but I'm wondering if you just for a moment speculate about some of the reasons for that 18-year-old drop, why we have 7 plus percent fewer uh, of those uh, students coming to campus. Well, it's, it really, it, you know, I, I hate to use this cliche about a perfect storm, but there really was so, so many factors converging that I think all could have contributed. And it's it's certainly hard to know um, how much of this decline is due to any one of them. I think um, there's no question that there, there, there have been students that were forced, kind of let's say forced off of their plan due to circumstances like the difficulties in the in the financial aid application whether that meant they couldn't apply at all or their application got in late or their school's ability to uh, package and award their aid came too late for them to be able to make a a, a reasonable choice and, and and a commitment to enroll i think there's also a lot of students who are probably actively making a different choice so not not by force but uh for for their own uh futures for what they see as their needs in terms of uh post-secondary um um uh whether it's uh, vocational choosing vocational programs at community colleges instead of four-year schools or choosing to go directly into the workforce where they're able to, in many cases, um, see higher wages than, um, than, than they would have expected in previous years. And compared to the growing costs of college, that's looking like a better option for many students. And, and the third possibility is that there are probably in many cases in some uh, some uh, regions and some uh, demographics there there are probably just fewer of those high school graduates to begin with this year um, and and you put all those three things together and you know you can see kind of traces of each of those effects in some of the specific data points that we were able to identify in our in our report and so i think you you know there's def there's certainly all all three of those things are going on some of them have been going on for years um and and we just we just can't really say how you know how to quantify how much of this decline in freshmen is due to any one of those causes Understood. I mean, that's going to be the work of researchers for some time, I think. Um, yeah. <clears throat> friends, I, I, have, I have lots of questions for Doug, um, but I want to defer them over to you. And so uh, I would love to hear, uh, first of all, I'm going to tell the online audience, uh, please, what questions you have, either uh, type them in the Q&A box or click the raised hand button to join us on the virtual stage. Uh, and for those of you who are in person, who can't hear those questions because they're occurring on the screen, I'll read them out loud so everyone can see them. Uh, I'd also like to hear from my uh, three uh, wonderful guests on the stage. Do any one of you have a question right now? Yeah, please, it sees the mic. You Thank should you. identify yourself. Uh, I'm Deborah Feeks. I'm the Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences at Texas A&M San Antonio. Uh, Doug, can you hear her okay? I can. 
I, I am a chemist by training, and the American Chemical Society publication, Chemical and Engineering News, recently put out an article saying that the number of chemistry majors had decreased by about 24%. It was huge in the STEM field over the last five years or so. And, and I'm curious if your data is drilled down enough to say what majors are growing, are there majors growing, what majors are declining, and if we're all going to offset the, de the decline in freshmen, are there majors that you think would be particularly good to be looking at and reviewing for growth? Yeah, great question. Please go ahead, Doug. Yeah, we we certainly do have details by uh, majors, and and um, if you look at our report, um, you can you can separate out. You can choose uh, the program level, so you can look at majors, the top gainers and losers for the largest majors in uh, in bachelor's degree programs, in associate degree programs and even in undergraduate certificate programs. Um, and, you know, I, I would say um, the, the, biggest, uh, the biggest gains were not, certainly not in the, in the, um, in the natural sciences. Wow. Um, they were in business, in health, in engineering, um, and, and even in uh, some of the social services uh, programs. Uh, the the bigger the biggest losers, uh, which has been continuing for some time, are liberal arts and the humanities, um, social sciences, English, English language and literatures, um, and 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 computer science this year has kind of slowed to pretty much flat at all at at all three of those levels yeah. after after many years of of really really strong growth um so i think i i honestly don't actually know about chemistry um that's not one of the bigger majors so it doesn't show up in our in our list of which i think is like the top 20 or something um, um but i i'm i'm i don't doubt your that that what you have de have uh, described for um, for Texas is um, is probably 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 taking place um, nationally as well. Thank great, you. great question. Thank you. Uh, great answer too. Please. Hi. Hello. My name is Melinda Roberts, and I'm the dean of the College of Arts and Sciences at Indiana State University. Uh, so when we look at enrollment trends across Indiana, you know, obviously we've all been worried and looking. Uh, into the future about the demographic cliff. Um, but we often say in Indiana, we, we, we already hit it because we have one of the lowest college going rates right now uh, in the country. And last I checked, we're getting pretty close to about 50%. And so when we look at that, of course, there's a whole host of reasons and you've noted some of them. You know, people are challenging the idea and the value of a college education industry and business leaders in the state have encouraged students, uh, high school students, to just go on into uh, the career fields and things such as that. So I guess my question for you is, as you're looking at states that are similar to this and that have those lower college going rates that had sudden drops really in the last uh, 10 years, are they going to be affected more substantially by the demographic cliff as well, or are they already there? Great question. Um, I think... I think we're already seeing some of those effects. You know, the, the if you look nationally, the 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 cliff is is not supposed to have begun yet. Uh, I mean, the, in fact, uh, twenty four or twenty five was was projected to be the kind of apex, um, and they and the declines wouldn't start until the you know a year at the next year and all the following years. But when you look at that by region of the country, it's a very different picture emerges and the, and that there you you have almost all the all the the growth is in the south and the west and areas in in the midwest yes. and the northeast have already started to decline uh -huh. and um, so we're we're certainly seeing that in in this year's numbers we saw it in last year's numbers um, um, 
And it also shows up in the race and ethnicity breakdowns. So one of the really surprising um, uh, findings in this fall, particularly for freshmen, was that the number of uh, the number of white students it just stands out as a as a major source of decline in freshmen this year, um, and all the um, I mean all the other race and ethnic categories are also falling, but by much smaller uh, percentages. So the whites are dropping by like ten or eleven percent, and oh. if you look at um, um, black and multiracial students. Uh, they're they're both falling by only about six percent, and then Hispanic and Asian students are um, even smaller, less like one two percent. Um, and and again, the demo that that reflects the demographics because when you when you break out the projections, and these are the projections that came from uh, Wichi um, back in. 2020. So there's a lot that's changed since then. But they, but just in terms of the number of uh, um, births 18 years back, you know that's that that's pretty solid. Um, the the number of white students uh, expected to graduate from high school uh, has been declining very slowly by about one percent a year for an, for a number of years now in the projections. And um, uh, while Hispanic students and Asian students uh, uh, have been increasing, and Black students have been essentially flat for several years, so so that that is real. And what's what's harder to understand in that dynamic, though, is the effect of the pandemic, which I think um, you know you've heard about. Uh, um, um, learning losses in high school and elementary school. You've heard about absenteeism in 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 uh, uh, K twelve, and um, and I think a lot of that is probably leading to um, um, kind of educational burnout among students, even if they are graduating oh. on time. Um, they it's. It seems to me that many of them just wouldn't be all too excited about um, signing up for another four years of school after a, a you know probably a horrible high school experience during the pandemic. This you know of course is the first um, class that would have spent all of their high school years in the in the pandemic era, starting in ninth grade in twenty fall of twenty twenty. Um, so that could also be having an effect at this point in, in why we see the, the numbers of 18 year old freshmen declining uh, by much larger uh, percent uh, than, than what the demographic projections suggest it should, should have been based on those pre-pandemic estimates. Thank you, Doug. Thank you for the great answer to this excellent question. Thank you so much. We, uh, do you want to go ahead? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I, 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 it was, there's a there's a gentleman there with a with a beard and a red tie. I don't want to lose you. Can can you stick around for five more minutes? Excellent. Excellent. Please go ahead. Yeah, I have a, a very quick question. I'm Abdullah Midouj. I'm the dean of the College of Science and Technology at North Carolina A and T State University. What you are telling us and what we see in numbers uh, pushes us to uh, think about retention effort within our universities and colleges and so and basically fixing the the so-called leaking pipeline mm -hmm. uh, what do you i mean how far can the retention effort go in fixing the enrollment uh, numbers decline number in numbers that we do see i know that this year for instance freshman class was down five percent but the overall enrollment went up slightly due to retention so how far can these retention efforts go to fixing this problem? Yeah, re really good question. I love this question. I'm, I mean, we so we reported, we have a separate report that focuses on persistence and retention. And when we when we released our last edition of that report this, this past spring, 
um, you know, we found that uh, retention and persistence, so including students who are still in college but have transferred to another school, um, those those rates both went up uh, by about a percent. Hmm. And um, that's that's been a trend for, for the last couple of years. So there's certainly, there's, um, there's certainly a lot more room for improvement in retention and persistence. You know, the overall rates for a freshman class are, are only like 70 some odd percent. And, um, um, and yet I think if you, if you really contemplate the amount of effort that's been going into uh, improving retention for uh, on campuses across the country in the last few years, and particularly schools that are using technology and really, really trying to um, I, uh, proactively identify students who might be at risk of leaving, and 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 reaching out with with uh, personal uh, appeals and and counseling and assistance to try and help them stay in um i'm surprised that it hasn't that 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 needle hasn't moved more mm -hmm. and so i think it's 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 certainly a success story so far and there's no question it's been a huge part of 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 the increase in total undergraduates this year as we as as you said but I don't know that um, that it's that it's. Not, well, I guess I would say I'm not optimistic that that the progress that we've made in the last few years can can grow much more. I I would also add I, I think another important part of what's contributing to the total undergraduate increase this year, on top of uh, retention, is is. Uh, colleges that are also doing a better job of um, attracting or, or bringing students back who have stopped out. So this, these are students that we call we call some college no credential. They've been out of the out of the classroom for at least uh, eighteen months in our report. And you know we we sh we update this number every every year, and there are over forty million Americans out there. Um, who who fall into this some college no degree or no credential category? Wow! Um, and we also found in our latest report this year that the number of those returning after the one after a stop out of at least a year and a half um, and re-enrolling uh, had had increased this year. So so that's that's an important contributor as well. Thank you. That was a great question. Uh, and thank you, Doug, for that excellent, excellent answer. Thank you. And now, hello. Hi, I'm uh, David Bowman. I'm the Dean of the College of STEM at Eastern Washington University. And you just stepped in front of me, Bowman. No, I was here first, dude. <laughs> I didn't say, I'm sorry. No, I'm teasing. Already the abuse. I mean, yeah. 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 <laughs> I used to work for her. Um, so uh, dual enrollment is a big and growing trend across the nation. And in some states, it's already a massive tsunami. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm wondering if you can speak to that in terms of enrollment when we have students showing up on campus that have already completed 60, 90, or even more semester credits, what the heck wow. does a four-year degree even mean anymore? Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Absolutely. Um, this is this is an important uh, um, dimension as well. Uh, we've been tracking very large annual increases in dual enrollment for high school students. Seven percent this year. I think it was eight, maybe even nine percent last year. So these these numbers are are really growing, and that is also so. It, when we talk about the total undergraduate students, that conversation. Uh, um, about persistence and returning from stopouts, uh, you can add on because we're also counting dual enrollments in that total undergraduate number, um, and so that's a that's a contributor. It's still relatively small. The total size of that population yeah. is small relative to all undergraduates, but the growth rates are huge, and I think those will continue. the The question that that 
I worry about is that it looks like more students. Um, and a lot of people claim that getting high school students taking college classes earlier while still in high school um, will increase the college going rate in the long run. I'm not convinced at all of that. I think that I think that for the most part, it, dual and en dual enrolled high school students are students who were already on their way to college regardless. And and the dual enrollment is just accelerating their path to a degree. It's saving them money. I'm not saying it's not a great thing, uh -huh. but I don't think it's it's actually drawing more students into the college pipeline than there would have been. And in fact, if you're a college or a university, like you like you just said, it's shortening the amount of time that they are eventually going to be on your um, on your campus. If you're awarding them 30 or 60 credits before they right before they even arrive, you're not going to get four years of enrollment out of them. Yeah. yeah, but I think the mic is quiet. Oh, okay. they, sh they shut it off on me. Maybe I'm not allowed to. Um, so just one quick follow up on that. Do you see a difference in trends for where those dual enrollment students are going? Are they at big regional flagships R ones or are they going to regional institutions? Because the impact is vastly different mm -hmm. depending on the kind of institution we're talking about receiving them. Yeah. Yeah, we haven't actually tracked that, but um, but the, uh, the researchers at um, Teachers College Columbia, uh, the Community College Research Center, have just done exactly that using our data. They've they've put out a, a very uh, a thorough report on on where do those students go, and and the first finding is that they they don't typically stay at the community college. So most of the dual enrollments are at community colleges. But when those students finish high school, they don't end up enrolling as associate degree students at those community colleges. They're going on to four year institutions. And your question is good. I don't know the answer, whether it's whether it's, um, um, you know, the, the flagships or the small regionals or what have you. I'm, I, I don't I don't know, uh, but it is an interesting question. Well, I think there may also be some differences in terms of states which have different policies um, and and some that have encouraged um, almost all students uh -huh. to take dual or enabled them to take dual enrolled courses. And and that would be um, a change to um, um, to what I said earlier about, you know, this is really just a self-selected bunch of students who would we're probably headed for the the uh, more selective for your colleges anyway um, and and uh, you know that that those those kind of statewide initiatives might actually uh, have an, a longer term effect of of adding to the pipeline oh thank you and if anyone in the chat um, wants to find that uh, Columbia teachers college study please please share a link to it uh, thank you for the question. Uh, and then we have a question from our, our outgoing president. Is this true? It's true, yes. Oh, I need to find They don't out. let provosts stick around. Um, <laughs> so good afternoon. I'm Leslie Kornick. I, I was uh, dean of the School of STEM at University of Washington Bothell, and I actually used to work for him at Eastern Washington. Um, and, and I'm currently the provost uh, at Chico State. And I was sent a very interesting document this morning, and this goes back to the question about closing equity gaps in STEM. Mm -hmm. um, so this is a report from the U.S. Senate Committee on Commerce, Science, and Transportation, ranking member the esteemed recently reelected Ted Cruz, entitled DEI, Division, Extremism, Ideology, <laughs> How the Biden-Harris National Science Foundation politicized science. And it, um, you know, has all kinds of interesting data on the status of grant recipients in terms of, you know, um, filtering language uh, about social justice, gender, race, environmental justice, and so on. And uh, I wonder if you could speak to 
the potential impact of that kind of report, mm. given the recent results of the election, uh, in further clogging up, tightening, cutting in half, whatever metaphor you would like to use, um, of the you know the entree of minoritized students into um, our STEM degrees, as well as the awarding mm -hmm. of NSF grant funds to faculty from minoritized populations and women. Excellent. Uh, Doug, were you able to hear all of that okay? Oh, uh, yeah. Okay. Um, Good. Um, I'm still trying to unpack some of it in my mind. I, that's a huge question. And um, um, I don't have much of an answer for you, unfortunately. I, I mean, you know, I think, it, just in terms of what we're seeing this fall, um, I'm surprised that the that the numbers of of um, underrepresented students has held up as well as it yeah. as it as it has. Yeah. Um, um, in fact, we saw smaller declines. So I. Um, certainly compared to white students, as I described, but also when we look at um, um, students from the, the lowest uh, income quintiles um, um, that had, in many cases, the smallest declines um, compared to, compared to uh, more uh, higher income students. Um, so I think that, you know, the, the change to the affirmative action um, has, has not had a, the expected effect, I think. Mm. Um, and I think that um, although there's one, one caveat there is that there, when we looked specifically this year at um, uh, HBCU institutions, uh -huh. we did see larger gains in undergraduates and, and freshmen there than at um, uh, colleges and universities more generally. So there may have been some effect of students um, um, opting for an HBCU where they might otherwise have gone to um, um, a more a more uh, traditional institution. Well, that's, that's about all I can offer there. I don't, you know, we don't break out the um, specific majors in terms of race and ethnicity. Um, so it's very hard to know whether that's having a, 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 a larger or smaller effect in the sciences. Thank you. Thank you, Doug, for the, uh, I, one of the things I love about hosting you as a guest is that you are always so honest about how far you want to go in answering a question uh, based, uh, based on, on the work that you do. Um, and thank you for the, for the terrific question. Uh, a couple of comments came up in the chat that I just want to make sure we shared. Uh, our good friend uh, Tom Haynes, not too far away from us in uh, Katy, Texas, uh, says that as a professor in a, a community college who teaches dual credit students, a lot of the students in Texas see it as a good alternative to advanced placement and are heading to senior institutions from there. Uh, also in the chat, uh, Ruben Puentadura, our excellent friend, uh, found that uh, Columbia study that Doug mentioned and shared a link to it in, in the chat. So we can, uh, uh, we can grab that. Uh, we have a couple more questions that have come up online. I just want to uh, bring them up. Uh, one was a quick question uh, from the excellent Moira McDermott, who wants to know, how does gender show up in the numbers? And they, if I remember rightly, Doug, <laughs> Uh, male and female enrollment increased about the same amount this fall? Yeah, yeah, very little distinction between uh, men and women in the numbers this fall. And I don't... In terms of the change, but they still remain roughly 60-40? Yeah. Oh, the total percentage is, yes, 60-40, but in just in terms of the percent change from last year in freshmen, they're within, you know, less than a percentage point of each other. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we've got another question in the chat, but I'm wondering, are there any questions from our in-person audience here? Or any questions from our wonderful guests on the, on the stage? 
please seize the mic. Right. Okay. Hi, this is Melinda Roberts again. I was going to ask a question about what you're seeing in international enrollments. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, obviously, as visa times are taking a lot longer, and we've noticed it in particular in India and Ghana and a few other places where we would have a lot of students coming. Uh, what are you seeing this year, and what do you anticipate? Yeah, we saw a, a, certainly a larger decline in international uh, enrollments this year. Um, we don't have that broken down by um, uh, by by nation, um, but I think that that is a that is a concern. I think from from what I've heard, there's a lot of decline um, uh, from of students fewer students coming from China um, and India as well. Um, and that's don't have yeah I don't have much I'm, more I'm looking that. ahead a bit I mean as the, as the future is here I'm saying yeah that's I, I'm not sanguine about where that goes uh, from good question really good question uh, we have another question from the chat uh, which had to do with um, uh, regional differences again this is from uh, Bart Trudeau who says in New York State 18 year olds are declining in most areas except New York City are similar trends happening nationwide with rural suburban declines and urban growth? Yeah, that's a great question. I I certainly don't know about what's happening with, um, with high school graduates at that level, um, but we haven't seen a huge disparity in, um, in enrollments for urban versus rural students. Um, a little bit where where the the increases this year I think were um, larger for urban than rural, but but they certainly all um, all increased. Okay, well, thank you, thank you, and uh, and this is uh, um, again uh, Bart. That's a really good question to ask. Uh, we have a question that just popped in uh, from uh, Tanaya Sengel, who, says, who asks, are the rising costs of student accommodation options leading to a decline in international students coming overseas for higher education? That's an interesting one. That is interesting. I, have, I don't have any, any information that would relate to that that I can think of. Tanaya, keep, keep following that. See, we'd yeah. love to hear from that. Yeah. Yeah, uh, we have a uh, um, we have a, a video, not a video question, but we have a question that I'm going to display on the screen from our excellent friend, the wonderful uh, Robin DeRosa in New England. Uh, and she asks this. My college's board of trustees is centering enrollment planning around Grawl's demographic model and the idea that we're about to hit a cliff. Now, critics like Neil Krauss refute uh, Grawl's dire predictions. What thoughts do you have? Uh, we already mentioned the demographic cliff a bit earlier, Doug. I'm wondering if, if you want to, uh, um, if you have anything to add to that about the question of, uh, you know, the you know, people seeing the cliff may or may not happen. And those of you who are in the room, you, you can see your question displayed on the screen. Um, yeah, I don't, I think from what I, I don't really have much more to add on that than what, what I've already talked about in terms of what we see demographically and have seen related to um, the, the, the projections that come from Wichi, and I'm not as familiar with, the, with Nathan Graw's numbers, um, which I think are more focused on the kind of um, um, trying to understand not just how many high school graduates there will be, but how many high school graduates that are likely to attend different types of institutions. Right, um, that's key. And yeah, so we, I, I don't, I don't really know how to answer that question. Okay, uh, but one of our deans might want to answer that question, please. Oh, no, I don't, I don't have an answer to oh, the question. You, you have I have a question. <laughs> okay, well, hang on one second. Uh, I just want to say thank you, Robin, uh, for the really good question. Uh, I believe CCAS is hosting Nathan uh, tomorrow. So that's one question I might be able to put to him. And thank you, Doug. Again, I, I always appreciate your careful responses. Please, please go ahead. 
Um, I was wondering if you, this is Deborah Feeks again from a and San Antonio, and, and I was wondering if you have tracking on modality. We are getting a lot of discussions at the universities about how we're offering the courses and in, in terms of online. Um, are you, Do you track that at all? Are you seeing differences in success rates, any of those kinds of things around modality? Yeah, that's a good question. We, we don't track it within institutions. Um, we only uh, uh, have a kind of vague sense of this by separating out what we call um, primarily online institutions, actually iPads, I think, um, mm -hmm. makes this definition, um, and multi-state institutions, uh, which are typically mostly online as well. And we've certainly seen larger growth, quite a bit larger growth in um, in those online institutions, but sir, there's there's uh, there's been a huge growth in uh, brick and mortar institutions that are also offering more of their classes online or or giving students choices about whether to whether to attend online or in person, and that level of differentiation we we can't um, we don't track. It's really important to see the uh, primarily online institutions just continuing to grow. Yeah, very, very importantly. Yeah. Um, Doug, did, uh, related to that, didn't you, uh, didn't the report find that uh, for profit colleges did really well this fall? That's right. Yes. Yes. And there's, and there's a certain amount of overlap there as well between mm -hmm. the, the online and the for profits. Indeed. Indeed. Yeah. Um, well, we have time for a couple of more questions. Um, and uh, here is one that, another question that asks you to speculate. Uh, and this is one that I'm sure will speak to the concerns of uh, every dean here. Uh, this is from uh, Tom Hames again, who asks, uh, is there any evidence of students turning away from colleges for ideological reasons and or the threat of conflict on campus? Uh, I would only be able to speculate on this. Uh, you know, one thing that we did look at is, you, if you go on our our um, dashboard online, you you can look at you can look at a state by state map of the nation and see the relative rates of increase or decrease in on, in enrollments, and um, it's uh, um, you know you can you can make your own judgments about red states versus blue states. I don't see any pattern there, to be honest. Um, you know, there are regional differences, like I talked about. Um, okay. this, the in growth is certainly um, visibly higher in the south and the, and the west, and lower in the in the northeast and the, and the midwest. But uh -huh. okay. uh, for ideological differences, I, I would not would not even want to speculate. That's a, that's a little too sensitive for me. <laughs> Oh gosh, that takes off the question I was going to ask then. So I'll, I'll just put that question on the on the table for right now. Please, we have another question in the audience. If if you could just introduce yourself first. Hello. Yeah. Okay. So I'm Ray. I'm Ray Herbersky. I'm at IU Indianapolis, Indiana mm -hmm. University, Indianapolis. I'm an associate dean in liberal arts. I'm I'm curious about whether or not there's data showing trends, uh, particularly in gender, towards different majors. So we know that there's a split between 60, 40 uh, female, male. Do you see an increase in women going to certain majors? Do you see an increase in men going to other majors? I know that, that engineering seems to be very popular. Business is very popular. How are things breaking down? And um, have we seen a shift over time of women uh, perhaps moving away from uh, certain majors and going into majors that they were not in in the last 10 or 15 years good question thank you please yeah really good question we we um we don't track that in our annual reports so i can't really say much about what's happened this year or last year you know in the in the latest trends we we paid more attention to um the gender differences in the sciences um Gosh, I think it's been uh, eight or ten years since we looked at that, and we found um, um, 
only slight, not you know, not very encouraging. Only slight changes in in say the number of women entering the sciences, um, and and almost no change. In fact, some declines in the number of women entering say computer science. But again, this was like uh, I think this was in the mid teens when we last really looked at some of these. Um, so I I don't have an answer for for you more recently than that. Well, it, not only is it a great question, but also, are, are, is Ficus? Fix, excuse me. Um, you're nodding vigorously. In, in, in chemistry, what's the current state of play in gender in chemistry? There's, there's been a lot of work towards gender mm -hmm. equity, and mm -hmm. it just doesn't seem to be moving the needle very much in many of the STEM fields. Mm -hmm. oh, interesting. Yeah. Interesting. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Doug, you, you mentioned the fields that were increasing, uh, especially allied health. Um, but I don't remember if you mentioned business as a major. Is that still a major one? Oh, yeah. One? Yeah, it's still the largest major. And and it's one of the biggest gainers this year, certainly, and has been in, in recent years. I think the other thing that's interesting, though, on the, on the majors is that when we look at the community colleges and, you know, the, the community colleges, uh, um, actually uh, gained a little bit in freshmen this year, and their overall um, uh, enrollments have increased faster since the pandemic than the four-year colleges have. Of course, they had a lot further to, to go. Oh, yeah. They, yeah. they lost the most during the first couple of years of the pandemic. But when we look, when we look at the, the, the um, program level, um, enrollments that are that are driving that growth in the community colleges. Um, it's it's very much focused on um, m more vocational programs in the community uh -huh. colleges uh -huh. um, and uh, schools that focus more on vocational programs. Uh, so both at the at the kind of school level, like vocational focused community colleges versus more transfer focused or academic focused community colleges. There's been a big difference, much larger growth on the vocational side and smaller on the transfer and academic side. Um, but also at the ma major level, whether you look at associate degrees or certificates um, within the community colleges, mm -hmm. the, the vocational focus, the vocational programs have been growing much faster than the academic ones. Well, you, you mentioned certificates. Ever since your report came out, I've been hearing from uh faculty across the country saying that their institutions are now considering expanding certificates. I, I have, we're, we're almost out of time. So I have one last enormous question to ask you. Uh, and this is, this is particularly for the audience here. I, I'm wondering, based on all of your research, your fine grade knowledge of student enrollment in colleges and universities, do you have any advice or recommendations for the deans assembled here? Anything that they should be paying attention to or working on? It will hold you to it, you know, of course. <laughs> I, I really think the most potential, um, it, it may not be the easiest uh, um, path, but I think the most potential is what we, what we talked about earlier is increasing retention and, uh, and, and finding ways to attract uh, stopped out students who, um, you know, had, had a plan for higher ed and for whatever reason, they got they got bounced off of that, and I think that there's there's a, a ton of potential to find uh, uh, more attractive ways to to uh, bring those students back to campus and give them an opportunity to finish what they started. Thank you. And you said it was something like thirteen percent of the United States population, an absolutely huge number of people. Um, if if I could have um, just a, a quick round of applause from everybody for Doug and our guests on stage. Uh, this has been terrific. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Uh, how, do, how do we keep up with you, Doug? What's, what's the best way to keep up with your research at the Clearinghouse? Uh, NSCResearchCenter.org. You will always you. find our latest releases. Um, we're still putting out about 10 to 12 publications every year that are all uh, freely available for the public Indeed. on our website. And I read them avidly. Thank you so much, Doug. I can't wait to the next one. Please take care, enjoy New York, and we'll be in touch soon. Thanks. Bye-bye.
And uh, friends, if uh, just to point out where we're headed, um, thank you all for the great questions. Uh, thank you all to the uh, uh, wonderful people face to face as well as online. Many thanks to uh, Yusuf and Justin who did heroic work in making sure all the AV systems work smoothly. If you want to keep talking about this online, uh, of course, you can see we are available on the socials. Just use the hashtag FTTE. Now, if you'd like to look into our previous sessions, including the ones on uh, enrollment, just go to tinyurl.com slash FTF archive. Uh, if you'd like to look ahead to our upcoming sessions, just go to the forum website, forum.futureofeducation.us. And thank you all again for uh, all of your participation. I hope everybody stays well in this pretty chaotic time. Uh, now it's back to Austin, Texas for our live sessions. Take care, everybody. See you online next time. Bye-bye.